everybody. Oh my goodness. And just like that, we are all of a sudden live. So glad to finally be here today talking with all of you. This is the Co Big Week for Small Business. My name is Steve Patterson, the host of uh, Twin Cities Live here in Minnesota. This is my Minnesota studio. It's also the corner of my living room and more specifically, the only clean corner of my living room. Really happy to be with you guys. You know, it's funny. For the last four years, I've been able to partner with the U.S. Chamber, and it's been so fun because we have gone all across the country meeting with small business owners, talking about running a small business today in America. We've been to, let's see here, Salt Lake City. We've been to Dallas. We've been to Atlanta. We've been right here to Minneapolis, which I love, Phoenix, Houston. We've been all over the place, but as you can see, it's a little bit different this year. I know it's a little bit different for you as well. And it's no secret that it has been an especially hard year on small businesses. We talk about small business every day on our show, Twin Cities Live. We get it. And man, we, I just speak as the country, we are polling for you. So thank you for what you do. The good news is we're all here today, right? We've all made it this far, which means there's determination in the virtual room, so to speak. There's some grit, there's some resilience and a whole lot of creativity. And the hope is that everybody comes out on the other side even stronger than we were when we went into this whole thing. Now, here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm just so happy that we actually get to be with uh, you all here today. It's virtual. Thousands of people all across the country are with you right now. So thanks and welcome to all of you. An action-packed week is planned. This is going to be really great. It's aimed at giving you the tools and the strategies that you need to succeed both now and in the future, because there will be some new normal that awaits us. So uh, we want to equip you for that. So across the week, we're going to have discussions, powerful speakers right here on the main screen that you're watching right now. And this is really fun. We're going to wrap things up on Thursday. And I'm so glad that we still get to do this. It's the Dream Big Awards, which is going to be great. Uh, I'm going to be joined by some very special guests to recognize eight entrepreneurs for their achievements this year. And if you've been unable in the past to attend that event in DC, uh, you'll get to attend it now virtually. So we hope to see you here on Thursday as well. Now, I've got to say, none of this would be possible without our amazing partners. I want to first start by thanking our presenting sponsor, Chase for Business. Thank you so much for helping to pull this off, uh, off rather. On top of this, we have some great supporting sponsors as well. CDW, Dell Technologies, FedEx, MetLife, Square, and Staples Connect. Now, be sure to check out. They've got some reimagined virtual booths. That's what we're doing this year. So do check them, uh, check them out. They've got cool resources, and they would love the chance to connect with you. We would also love to hear from you, okay? I know what you're thinking. It's just you in your living room or your office right now, but it's just you and me. Listen, we want to hear from you. So get engaged. You can be a part of this program. Do you see that? Uh, there's a text box to the right of your screen. Locate that right now. So at times during the event, uh, our speakers will answer your questions. And this is really great because if you're nervous about asking a question in front of a group, you have to do the microphone, introduce yourself. You don't have to. So you can submit your question on the right-hand side, be a part of it, and engage in these uh, discussions. You can also answer our poll questions that we will be throwing up there. In fact, let's do it. Everybody get loose here, all right? Loosen up your fingers. We're going to start. We're going to ask this one to get us going. In one or two words, what is the most important quality that keeps your business strong? So when I say what keeps your business strong, the word or maybe two words that come to mind are what? Uh, add those in there, and then we will reveal those at the end of our session here today. All right, with that. Let us get started. I hope you're feeling the excitement wherever you are. You're probably in your jammies. No judgment here. I'm wearing slippers. I am pleased to introduce a man who understands business owners inside and out because, frankly, he's been fighting for them his entire career. We are honored to welcome Tom Donahue, the CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Well, thank you, Steve, for that introduction. And thank all of the participants for being here for the beginning of the big week for small business. This week, we're celebrating your achievements while helping you gain new skills and insights to lead our nation's recovery. The past seven months haven't been easy, and that's particularly true for small business owners. Our nation is facing challenges many had never prepared for or never considered before March. 
But you've all adapted. You've innovated. And you've led by example at a time when this country needed you most. When we experienced sweeping lockdowns in the early days of the pandemic, you all transitioned your operations, in some cases overnight, to continue serving your customers and your communities. When unclear public guidance slowed business reopenings in the summer, you all took up the mantle of leadership to safely resume operations, implementing new health procedures, trying to enforce mask mandates, and all the more. And as lawmakers continued to delay further economic aid that is so badly needed, you are steadfast in your resolve to make it through and emerge stronger. And by the way, my view is while this meeting goes on during this week, we're gonna get something from the Congress. The chamber has been very inspired by you and we wanna continue hearing from you about how your businesses are faring and what we can do to help. Throughout this conference, you have the opportunity to ask questions, to share experiences, and to learn from each other to better navigate our ongoing crisis. This event is tailored for you. It's tailored to you because we know that business experience is different for those running a small enterprise. Most of you don't just play one role. You might also be the office manager, the bookkeeper, the human resources director in charge of IT, the healthcare provider, and who knows what else. Juggling all of those tasks is difficult in a good economy, in good weather, so to speak. And it's either hard, much harder now. There's nothing to say about running a business and there's nothing small uh, about your impact. Small businesses employ 47% of the US workforce. And by the way, many of those small businesses keep large businesses running. Without them, they couldn't succeed. But more than that, you are an integral part of your economy and of your community. You all represent more than just a product or a service to your customers. You're the face, you're the name, you're the neighbor, and you're the friend. You are woven into the very fabric of your community and you embody an entrepreneurial spirit that is uniquely American. It's what we stand for. The world looks a lot different than it did in March and some of our ways of life are sure to have changed forever. Others will get back to soon. But with our partnership and your innovation and your resourcefulness and your reliance on each other and your resilience, one thing will stay the same. Small businesses will continue to line our communities and lift our country through this crisis and beyond. I hope you enjoy this year's conference and that you return to your work with new ideas, energy, and insight. I wanna thank you for joining us. And most important, thank you for all that you do in your communities and for our country. One final observation, you're all very busy. And this program over the course of the week runs for some amount of time. Look over the agenda very carefully and make sure that you and perhaps some of your colleagues get to those sessions that answer the questions that you need help on. And when it's all over, if there's anything you haven't gotten and you think you need to know, know more about, just call us, we'll get it for you. We'll make sure you do. Thank you again and have a great meeting. Boy, I, I've heard from him for the past few years, and every time I hear from him, I just love it. I hope that you're feeling inspired. We're getting uh, started off on the right foot. Mr. Donahue, thank you so much for that. Now, 
Would you please welcome Brett Reinhardt? Brett Reinhardt is the Chief Marketing Officer for our presenting sponsor, Chase for Business. I'll take this opportunity again to say a huge thank you to Chase for Business for making today possible. And a thank you to you, Brent. Take it away. Hi, I'm Brent Reinhardt, the Chief Marketing Officer for Chase for Business. We are delighted to have you join us and are hopeful that this week's programming will help you gain strategies, grow skills, and make valuable connections. We know small business owners are living through unprecedented times, and Chase has been working around the clock to help small businesses regain their footing. To date, we have funded more than 280,000 loans. That's more than $32 billion in relief. And what's more impressive is approximately 80% of those went to businesses with less than 10 employees. There is still a lot of work to be done, and that's why we are a proud sponsor of the United States Chamber of Commerce. We've partnered on a series of virtual events aimed at giving you the tools you need to succeed. We've seen you across the summer at the Co Blueprint Virtual Event Series, which has drawn audiences of small business owners from every state to sessions focused on topics that matter to you. Our events have focused on financial planning, branding, diversity and inclusion, and many other topics that you'll be able to discuss in depth this week. We look forward to your participation and we wanna hear from you. Join us for a breakout session if you'd like. Some of my colleagues are hosting sessions on the importance of an advisory team and also interviewing small businesses just like you. You can also visit our virtual sponsor booth, explore our offerings, read some great content and get in touch with us directly via the contact us button. We can't wait to see you and hear from you. We'll get through this time together and come out better than ever before. Thank you so much and enjoy the week. Thank you so much, Brent. Well said there. All right, let's talk about something that I think will uh, hit home for most of you today. This year, you as small business owners, have you been watching Washington a little bit more closely perhaps than you have in the past? Because why? Well, many entrepreneurs have quickly had to learn how to navigate all sorts of complex government programs, loans and grants. What's really great is that here at Co and the U.S. Chamber, we have the experts in-house, and today we're going to bring them in with the hope of really just breaking down uh, some of the most complicated and most pressing topics for you, small business owners, right now. So we're also going to set aside a lot of time for your questions. So remember, this is an awesome opportunity for you to get engaged. If a question comes to mind as you're listening to them, uh, add that into our comments, and we hopefully can get to that. It's over there on the right-hand side of your screen. With that, let us now welcome the co-content director, Jeanette Mulvey, and the U.S. Chamber's Executive Vice President and Chief Policy Officer, Neil Bradley. everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Neil. Hi, Jeanette. Good to see you again. You too. So, Neil, you've been a fantastic resource for small businesses throughout the pandemic. So, first of all, thank you so much for that. And I know everyone's really appreciative of having you here to translate what's going on in Washington. So, I'm just going to jump right in. So, Please. yeah, let's talk. I'm sure you're tired of talking about it, but let's talk about PP lo PPP loans. I just want to confirm all those funds are spoken for. You cannot apply for one anymore. Is that correct? Yeah, the program closed on August 8th uh, under the statute. Sadly, there's actually still money left, but by law, no one can apply for a new loan right now. Is there any chance that they will reopen those applications? There is. It's uh, As they say, it will take an act of Congress uh, actually changing the law. Uh, but this the current uh, currently under discussion. It's part of the negotiations uh, between House Democrats, Senate Republicans, and the administration right now. I don't suspect it's going to get done before the election. It might, uh, but when it does get done, uh, one thing that is certain is that we expect the, the PPP program to reopen. Oh, okay. That's good to know. So same question about the disaster loans, which the idle loans, um, can you still apply for one of those? And could you also just clarify for people the difference between the two kinds of loans? 
Sure. Uh, the EIDL uh, loan program is still open. You can go to the SBA's website um, and apply today if you're interested. Um, there was a separate EIDL grant program, a $10,000, up to $10,000 grant that could accompany the loan. That's no longer available, but the loan itself is still available. Um, the difference, the main difference between IDLE and PPP is IDLE operates like a, a normal loan. You got to pay it back. Uh, the PPP program, the great benefit that it had is that uh, while it was a loan, if you use the proceeds from the loan for certain qualifying expenses, namely um, retaining your employees, you could have the loan forgiven. So it became more like a grant rather than a loan. Right. Okay, so now people who did get PPP loans are starting to think or are starting to have to apply for, for paying them back. So can you talk a little bit about that process and just the challenges people are coming up against and your advice to people who are starting to apply for PPP loan forgiveness? Uh, that's exactly right. So the folks who received a, a PPP loan early uh, in this process after the CARES Act was enacted uh, this spring, are likely have near the point where they're thinking about loan forgiveness um, and the application for loan forgiveness. The Treasury Department SBA actually made some news on this at the end of last week when they announced a new simplified form for businesses who had loans with less than $50,000. Uh, we've been working with Congress along with our allies to try to, try to get a simplified loan process for every small business who has a loan for up to $150,000. There's actually bipartisan support for that in Congress. And like reopening the PPP program, we think that simplified loan forgiveness is something that will occur once Congress and the administration finally come to an agreement. Now that said, I can't guarantee when that's gonna happen. I don't, I don't know when, when the, the magic will, uh, dust will settle and when we'll have something that's on the president's desk being signed into law. And a lot of small businesses are, wondering what should they be doing now? And the way I tend to think about it is a small business who might find themselves in one of three different groups. The, the first group is uh, small businesses who use their loan proceeds to, uh, for qualifying expenses, uh, to pay employee salaries, for example. And you're filling out your loan forgiveness forms and you're looking at that and you're going, hey, look at this, this is great. I'm gonna get 100% of my loan forgiven. If you're in that bucket, then you might wanna just go ahead and file that paperwork uh, with your lender to get that process started. You might look at it and you might say, well, you know, I think we're gonna qualify for full loan forgiveness, but there's a lot of paperwork here. And you know, the, the way my business is going right now, I don't have time to devote to pulling all that paperwork together. I'd really like to see if that expedited 150,000 and below EZ process comes into effect. That would put you in the second bucket. You might simply want to wait to see what happens with Congress and see if they, if they end up enacting a simple applied loan process. At this point, I think it's important to remind folks that remember, you don't have to pay back, begin paying back your loan for up to 10 months after the end of the covered loan period. Um, you have 10 months to apply for forgiveness. And during that period, you don't have to pay proceeds of your loan. Then there are some people who I would say are in the third bucket. That is that they use some of their loan proceeds to pay for qualifying expenses, but they're looking at their loan and they're saying, I'm still going to owe some of this back. In which case you might be thinking, if Congress does what they've said they're going to do, they're going to expand the eligible uses for a PPP loan. They can expand the eligible uses to include PPE equipment, i.e. all that sanitation expenses that people have been investing in. They've considered expanding it to cover supplier costs, for example. And you may be able to get more loan forgiveness after Congress makes those changes. If you're in that third bucket, it might make the most sense to simply wait a few weeks, see what Congress does, and then decide how to proceed. Great, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, so. Uh, cognizant of the fact that lots of people in our audience probably didn't get a PPP loan. I want to just ask you a little bit more about um, a fourth stimulus package more broadly. I know Tom alluded to it earlier. Just any updates on that? Do you have any gut feeling on when or if that might happen and what that might mean for small businesses? 
Yeah. Uh, well, let's begin with the fact that it should have happened months ago. Um, they should have come to an agreement uh, on Capitol Hill. It's what we were urging them to do at the U.S. Chamber. Um, they are way past due on, on getting this done. Um, and it's really hard uh, to get these kind of things pulled together three weeks before uh, an election where the presidency and both houses of Congress are on the line. So it, it may come together, as Tom alluded to this week. It might end up waiting until after the election, what's called a lame duck session of Congress. It's also possible that it's an issue that the new Congress and an administration take up at the beginning of 2021. I do think something inevitably is going to happen. There's just too much to be to, that needs to be done to support the economy for nothing to happen. Uh, but the timing is, is a bit in question. As to the terms, what it would look like, I expected that in addition to reopening the people, for those who never received a PPP loan. There will also be something called a second draw for small businesses who have had a significant reduction in revenue, say uh, 35% less gross receipts in a month or a quarter this year compared to the same period the year before, an opportunity to get a second PPP loan to help extend covering expenses. There's also discussions of uh, expanded tax credits that would help employers meet their employment expenses. I think some mix of those kind of things are what we should expect in this next phase four bill whenever it comes together. Got it. Thank you. Um, let's shift gears. I want to talk to you about the H-1B and the H-2B visa programs, which there was a fairly major development uh, about those last week. But could you just start by telling our audience the difference between an H-1 and an H-2 Visa yeah, program. so the federal government runs all types of different uh, temporary worker programs. Um, some of them really focus on high tech. Uh, traditionally, we call these H-1B visas. Um, these are folks who could be coming in to work on technology programs, uh, computer programs. Uh, they work for companies big and small all across uh, the United States. And then we have what are generally termed seasonal workers. Um, those are generally H-2Bs. It's not just agriculture that has seasonal workers. If you're in the landscaping business, for example, you there, there are seasons to that business. Um, if you think about uh, in the summer, you have beach resorts who need seasonal workers. And in the winter, you have ski resorts and, and other winter sports uh, that utilize seasonal workers. Um, about a little over a month or so ago, um, uh, the president issued an executive order that sought to restrict uh, the issuances of new visas, including those tech H-1Bs, those seasonal workers, and also a whole string of other workers, so-called J visas, uh, that cover everything from uh, uh, students who are coming in uh, on, a, on a visa, who are both studying and working, uh, to people who are coming in to, to, to do uh, support programs uh, for families. Um, the U.S. Chamber, along with others, uh, sued uh, to block that executive order because it was our belief that it exceeded the authority that the president has. And a uh, federal judge just uh, last week uh, ruled that he concurred in the fact that that exceeded the authority um, and that uh, going forward uh, that the U.S. Chamber, uh, the other associations who sued, uh, that our organizations and our members could still go ahead and sponsor and apply for visas under those visa categories. Okay, so thank you for, that was, I think for a lot of businesses weren't clear on that. So thank you for that explanation. Um, shifting gears again, I know that a lot of small businesses now are facing challenges with their lenders, with their creditors, their landlords. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what options businesses have in terms of negotiating with creditors and whether you have any advice on how to do that? Well, this is this is sadly not unusual to a downturn, but when we have a, a downturn, um, it's often possible for, for businesses uh, to negotiate the terms, particularly of extended leases, et cetera, uh, with, with landlords. Um, and in particular, it might be especially relevant in this downturn because this is one of those downturns um, that we do expect to recover from. Um, 
Um, you know, we've already seen many businesses that uh, that have reopened. We've seen businesses, uh, small businesses, who've modified their operations, and we know that there are some who are on the cusp of uh, really returning to pre-pandemic levels once some of the social distancing requirements that are currently uh, necessary uh, go away. And so. Um, you know, presenting a case to creditors, to landlords uh, that, that really explain the business plan that the small business has, how they uh, intend to recover from this, what's changed in terms of the small business operations. You know, it, it never hurts to sit down and ask and try and to see if something can be worked out. And frankly, it's a lot better for the small businesses uh, to not have a, a big debt overhang. And it's a lot better for landlords and creditors to understand uh, what they might be able to, to earn in revenue and what they might be able to recover uh, than simply uh, pushing off these discussions so far into the future. Yeah, so you're saying it's really in the best interest of both parties to be having these conversations and keep the line of communication open. I, I, I've never known it to hurt to have these type of conversations. Uh, yeah. You may not find agreement, uh, but, but you may, and at least you'll have a better understanding of where both sides are coming. Yeah. Um, soon I'm going to introduce our panel, but I'm going to ask you one more question and then I will bring them in. Um, do you see any silver linings here? Do you see segments of the economy for small businesses that are growing or providing opportunity? We do. And so um, some some small businesses were early adopters of uh, moving to delivery services, to reconfiguring their businesses, to, to operate over, over the internet and to meet, to meet their customers' needs. And those folks have, have flourished in really remarkable ways. At the same time, it's created new opportunities. Um, you know, uh, as, as many uh, Americans are at home, they've refocused on making home improvements. You talk to folks in the home improvement sector and it's really become a banner year. Uh, we read about, and we have small business members who figured out that if, if restaurants are going to be sending food home as takeout orders, then that involves lots of stuff, containers to put that food in. There was a business opportunity there. You know, one of the, the most interesting data sets that we follow, we follow a lot of data sets at the U.S. Chamber, is on new business starts. Uh, individuals who are filing for an employer identification number and starting out on their business. And we saw a remarkable uptick in that over the course of the spring and summer, setting multi-year records. I attribute that to the fact that, um, that, that people are seeing opportunities, uh, they're taking advantage of them, and uh, ultimately that's going to be good news uh, for those entrepreneurs, for those new small businesses, and for the American economy as we yeah, that is great news. Thank you. So, Neil, hang on because I'm going to come back to you when we do the audience Q&A. But first, I'd like to introduce a couple of small business experts. Um, first, we're joined by uh, Lenore Horton, who is an attorney and a partner at Fisher Bowles LLP. Hi, Lenore. Hi, and Hi. And Manny Cosme, who is president and CEO of CFO Hello. Services Group. Hi, Manny. Hello. Hi. So welcome to both of you. I know that you guys have spoken on uh, with Neil before, uh, so I'm happy you were able to join us again. Lenore, I'm going to come to you first. Um, Neil and I just talked about businesses um, negotiating with their creditors and their landlords, and I'd like to know a little bit more about what kinds of advice you are giving to your clients about how to go about renegotiating these agreements. Right. Um, it's um, it's definitely something I think clients need to take a look at. Generally, small business owners should take a look at is if you have, especially if you have a debt where you know it's not possible to meet those obligations until you reopen or until you are back at um, more more consistent market levels, right, for your business. And um, for some of them, it's not a difficult conversation. Um, and then for others, it could be a rather longer negotiation. One thing I absolutely agree with Neil is to be proactive and to keep the conversation going. So for example, I've seen where we draft letters and we help the client craft communications to their creditors to explain simply what's going on and what they're doing to generate new revenues, how they're looking to pivot, 
um, and, and just making sure those creditors stay in the loop as to how the business is doing because radio silence is probably not going to be a confidence building measure for those you owe money right now. Um, so I've seen examples like this with landlords. Um, I've seen examples like this with suppliers. Uh, so I think that's, you know, being proactive and being having a degree of transparency is important. There are other options, though, um, but I would say that is definitely the starting point. Great. Thank you. That's good advice. So, Manny, I'm coming to you. Um, as Neil and I discussed, uh, PP loans have been exhausted for now, but businesses uh, still need cash. So can we just talk about what options they have in terms of more funding? Yeah, and that's actually a really great question. So just for you all to know out there, even though the PPP is at least temporarily uh, stopped, um, there is other money you can get, of course, you know, your traditional uh, lenders and whatnot, they're still loaning money. Um, I would always advocate to check out your local CDFI. That's a community development uh, financial institute, CDFI. Um, for example, here in Washington, D.C., there's a handful of them, and they really kind of exist to, um, to boost the local economy. And one of the major ways they do that is by uh, giving loans or lines of credit to small businesses that maybe cannot get uh, funding through a tr more traditional uh, uh, institution like a bank. Um, so that's always a really great resource. In fact, um, one of my contacts at one of our local CDFIs here uh, just told me the other day that they're actually looking actively for businesses to fund right now because there is such a need and they've actually received some public money to be able to do that. Um, so that's definitely an, a channel that you want to hit up. Um, and uh, of course, always you know keep checking your local and uh, your local and state governments. Uh, again, here in DC, we just had a new grant program roll out a few days ago, maybe last week, I think it was, or the week before. Um, that's really kind of uh, meant to help um, brick and mortar businesses that have suffered during this time. It's a little bit of money that they can now access, and that's brand new money that just came out. So you want to be constantly checking these channels as well. Great. Thank you, Manny. Lenore, coming back to you. Um, businesses, you know, we have the word pivot has never been used more times than in the last six months. So for businesses that are looking to pivot and just think about what's their long term viability as the pandemic wears on, what kind of advice are you giving? I think it's key to make sure that you're reaching out to those who have been servicing your business for a while. So, for example, professionals who service your business like CPAs, like CFOs and controllers, like attorneys who have some institutional history about your business. Um, if you've been developing good quality relationships with them over the years, it would be a good idea to have a talk with them about what they see and what they envision. Um, a lot of these professionals, yes, they have a professional stance that they're coming from, but they've also seen a lot with their other clients and they're usually servicing you because there's a certain degree of business savvy and business acumen. Um, so that's a great way is, you know, build your team of advisors as was talked about initially in this program. Um, make sure that you're tapping into that relationship that you've invested in. Another thing is to think about what is the pain point that you're experiencing when it comes to generating revenues right now. For many, it relates to uh, the, the restrictions um, that are necessary for public safety. So for example, if you need people in place um, in your actual location to be able to have the revenues that you had before, you would maybe see how much of that you could still capture through an alternative method of engaging with those customers or consumers, but then also see what's missing. You know, are there other opportunities? We've seen this in so many places. Um, we've seen uh, food service establishments start to partner with um, wholesalers. We've seen grocery stores start to, <laughs> we've seen restaurant supply companies start to make themselves available to for home delivery um, on a larger scale than is traditional. So, you know, really explore what you have at your disposal, what those pain points are for um, for maintaining your older revenues and tap into your unofficial team of advisors. Great. 
Thanks, Lenore. Manny, uh, one more question for you, and then I'm going to go to the audience for Q&A. So audience, keep typing your questions uh, into the panel on the right-hand side. So Manny, can you just take a minute and talk a little bit more about diversifying revenue streams and just how businesses can think about how they can offer additional products or services to help just with their um, financial income streams right now? Yeah, uh, this is actually my favorite topic. <laughs> so if I anyone know knows, that about you. Like, what I talk about all the time. Uh, so, um, you know, it's all about diversifying. And there's really kind of three channels you want to think about diversifying your revenue. So it's what I sell, who I sell it to, and how I deliver it. So the more you can diversify along those three channels, which is really just come up with new ways of doing each of those things, then the more diversified you'll be. And the cool thing is that as you start to kind of change one channel, all of a sudden you have a new revenue stream that you've developed. And so it actually exponentially grows, right? So who I sell it to, right? Who are you selling to? Maybe, um, and this is where I challenge people to think beyond just your, your direct customer. Maybe there are some parallel customers, horizontal customers that you can sell to. So for example, if I sell accounting services to a, a small business, maybe I can sell accounting services to another accounting firm or to other professional accountants, or maybe even to a nonprofit that services people that need accounting services, right? How I deliver it um, and whatnot. So the more you can diversify along those, the better off you'll be because then you can quickly pivot. And I'll tell you, actually, um, I have two clients um, that are really great examples of being able to pivot quickly during this um, pandemic, just really thinking outside the box and putting on the entrepreneurial hat. Um, one actually, uh, well, they were both in the event space and they both did two very different things. So one of them ended up actually because he had such a large workforce in being in manning these events, um, he was actually able to quickly pivot and help event spaces actually do cleaning. So just using that workforce, that resource that he had, just kind of retraining them quickly on doing something else and was able to actually keep his business going afloat. So that's just an example of really thinking critically and creatively looking at your resources and then looking at your three channels and being able to pivot. Great, thanks Manny. I'm gonna shift gears to the audience Q&A and Neil, not surprisingly, we have a lot of PPP questions. So I'm gonna to come to you, a couple quick ones. Um, do you think people will be able, if they open PPP loan applications again, do you think businesses will be able to apply for a second one if they got a first one? Um, most likely, but there will be uh, revenue constraints. So it won't, you'll, you'll only be eligible to apply uh, for a second loan if you can demonstrate that you've had a reduction in gross receipts above a certain amount relative to the same period the year prior most likely 25 or 35% reduction in gross receipts. So um, let's say you got a PPP loan, but your gross receipts this quarter are the same as they were last quarter, or only down you know, 5%, you're unlikely to qualify for that new second draw PPP. It's gonna be reserved for businesses that are continuing to experience significant revenue loss. And someone else asked if you were denied the first time, do you think that they will I think this person's saying, do you think they'll review existing applications that were denied? Or do you think you would need to start over applying for a second time if you were denied the first time? I guess it might be a question in which it was submitted late or something like that. Um, I would want to talk to either my lender uh, or reach out to the SBA on that. Um, I would operate with the assumption that that they may not have been carrying those over on the PPP program. Um, we, we experienced something similar with IDLE, but, but that was different. If you're talking, if the, ad, if the question is asking about PPP, uh, I'd first go to my lender and, and find out the situation from them. Okay, um, thank you for that. I'm gonna go to Manny with this question, but I may be coming back to you, Neil, if Manny doesn't wanna answer it. So Manny, this, per or just, I'm, not, I'm not sure. <laughs> This person is saying they, if they got the PPP loan and they got the idle advance, so the $10,000 advance, who do they pay that idle amount back to? But my understanding, I think, is that you don't pay that back. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. The advance was not, you don't pay that back. That's actually rolled into the PPP. So uh, you shouldn't have to pay that back. Okay. Neil, did you have anything else to say about that? That's exactly right. It just reduces your your PPP loan forgiveness. So if you if you got a hundred thousand dollar PPP and a ten thousand dollar idle grant, 
you qualify for $90,000 of PPP forgiveness. Okay. Um, Lenore, I'm going to come to you and hope that you're not going to tell me that you don't, that this isn't your thing. But the, so the, there's a lot of questions about how to decide when to apply for the PPP forgiveness. So just more broadly as an attorney, are you advising your clients on how to make these decisions? Yes, definitely. We were um, really spending a good portion of uh, April simply helping clients with their applications um, and providing them with guidance on that. Um, it, it definitely formed a large part of the work around the pandemic and responding to the pandemic. Um, in terms of applying, one thing I tell people is you have the guidance from the SBA and the IRS. I, I would like to remind people this is a, a, an amendment to the tax code and it's administered through the SBA, the loan program, but it all comes down to the tax code. And it's administered through the SBA because they already have relationships with banks because of lending from for SBA loans. So that's that's really the overarching framework for this. The first thing you want to do is see what your bank is doing. Although those government agencies are giving guidance, ultimately you have signed a promissory note with your bank. So you want to see how they are going to interpret the guidance, how they interpret the laws. They're putting many, many lawyers on this to make sure that they feel comfortable that they are implementing the program correctly and according to lots of banking regulations that most of us aren't really paying attention to, but are influencing the bank's behaviors. And so you really wanna first look, what is your own bank saying in terms of how, because that's where you have to submit your forgiveness application is through the bank where you got the loan from. So that's the first point of order is to go there and see how are they positioning it? What are they asking you to collect? What are, when are they telling you they'll start um, accepting applications? However they set that up is how you have to do the application for forgiveness. Okay. Manny, coming back to you. Um, how are you advising your clients on whether the, the, in, the expenses they had that they used the PPP loan to pay for whether those expenses are tax deductible, because my understanding from this question is currently those expenses are not tax deductible, but this person is holding out hope that they may change, reverse course on that and they would become tax deductible. Well, that's just the topic of the day. <laughs> that really is. There's a lot of discussion around that. So yeah, as of today, uh, the expenses are not tax deductible. So let me just take a second to kind of think about that. So traditionally, when you get a loan, and that loan is forgiven, that becomes taxable income. So right now, what Congress said was that um, that forgiveness, which is usually taxable, is not taxable. So let's say you get a hundred thousand dollar PPP, the hundred thousand dollars is forgiven. Normally, that whole hundred thousand would be taxed. However, in this this special case with the PPP, that is not taxed. So that's great. So then the question came: Well, what about the expenses that we used? To pay for the PPP. So if I had a hundred, if I use that money to buy, pay hundred thousand dollars in payroll, usually payroll is a business expense and it's deductible. But the IRS didn't want everyone double dipping, so they have said, no, you cannot double dip. You can't get a deduction for the hundred thousand dollars in payroll, which means that that entire payroll expense that you incurred this year, for example, now becomes part of your profit that you are taxed on. So it, in a sense, kind of reduces the effect of the PPP. And so that's why this has become such a hot topic right now that Congress is really looking at. As of today, I mean, you can, you can verify, but there has been no movement on that. So as of today, it's still not deductible, which means that that's really important for a small business to understand because your tax bill for this year could be a lot higher than you're expecting it to be as a result of this. So it's you have to be very, very careful about that and make sure you're putting some cash away to pay that tax bill. Thank you. Neil, oh. did you want to... Oh. Sorry. Well, and, and also state, and then that's the federal government. And then for states, same thing, because there's some discussions in states 
they may actually want to tax the PPP forgiveness. So there's a lot of stuff going on tax wise that you need to be aware of. And I highly, highly, highly advise that every small business out there talks with the, talk with their tax accountant to be aware of what's happening because you don't want to be hit with a tax bill that you can't pay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Neil, did you want to weigh in on that? that that's exactly right. And uh, uh, this is one that I, I'm not sure Congress is going to change. There's bipartisan support for it but it actually hasn't showed up in a lot of these packages. Um, that said, it's also an administrative interpretation. Uh, so an admin the administration could change their interpretation uh, in the future. And so it, it's one that uh, we're paying close attention to uh, for the reasons many cited, it, it, it would be nice to get this worked out um, so that, that small businesses didn't have to think about this. Uh, but right now that that's not the case. Okay, Neil, I have uh, two more questions for you. Um, this person is asking about the Main Street Lending Program, mm -hmm. and um, can you just talk about a little bit about what that is and what role that plays here for businesses? Sure. The Main Street Lending Program was a, a program uh, set up from the CARES Act through the Federal Reserve, and it is essentially a program in which um, the Federal Reserve is encouraging lending on the part of banks uh, to small and mid-sized enterprises. Um, and to help them, uh, to encourage them to make those loans, um, the federal government is essentially buying portions of those loans, which makes it more attractive uh, for, for banks to lend. Um, in contrast to PPP, which has had a lot of uptake, obviously, uh, we ran out of the initial tranche of money, uh, the Main Street Lending Program has not received as much interest either from uh, the lending community or even from from the business community yet uh, because of some of the concerns about um, the requirements that go along with it and the attractiveness of the program it's an important backstop and it's one we're glad that's that, that's there but it just hasn't been utilized as much as some of these other programs okay and then neil this person is asking and i think you're the right person to answer this what can small businesses do to demand is their word, but to encourage, to push, to advocate that the government pass another stimulus program. No, I actually like the word demand. Okay, uh, demand. I'll go uh, with that. You know, in, in the United States, uh, our elected representatives work for us, uh, the people. And it's, it's okay to demand that your elected representatives uh, get something done. And so uh, my best advice is uh, pick up the phone. Um, find the district number for your senator, for your member of Congress, um, and call up their district office. Tell them that you're a small business, that you're one of their constituents, how much this really matters, and um, you know that, that there's simply no excuse uh, for inaction. You know, uh, there, there's plenty of opportunities for everyone to do this, uh, to to point the blame. You know, at the end of the day, though, um, uh, who you blame. Uh, is not an excuse for failing to get something done that's really so critical to keeping so many small businesses alive and so many Americans employed. So um, my advice is demand action and don't accept any excuses. Thank you. Demand. We're going to go with that word. Lenore, two questions for you. One, um, just an interesting question that I've never really thought about, but this person is saying that they are like a mobile business, like a mobile detailing business, but there's lots of people, whether they're food trucks or pet groomers are all mobile. Are those considered brick and mortar businesses they wanna know? Um, it, it is a good question. And I guess my biggest um, you know, response to that is brick and mortar by whose definition, right? So um, what, is, what is the need to understand uh, what's behind that need to understand if it's a brick and mortar business, because if it's to qualify for a program, then you really want to understand what they mean by brick and mortar. But, um, you know, what's different when you have a location um, like that is it's movable, right? It's not tied to real estate uh, in, in the sense that it's a fixed piece of property that can't move. And so there are many ways it's going to be treated differently. Um, pop-ups are treated differently um, in, in many ways than, for example, a fixed retail location. But the question is, differently by whom? Differently, you know, in what way, right? So if it's a tax question, if it's a legal question, if it's a loan application or grant application question, 
if it's a program that you're applying to, that's really where you want to dig in and to see, you know, what's behind that question about um, brick and mortar. But traditionally, brick and mortar is associated with a fixed location. That may not be answering the question for your situation, though. Right. So dig a little deeper. That's that's um, that's a perfect answer. And I want, while I have you, though, I want to ask you one more question. Um, this person is asking specifically about grants for minority women who are starting a business. But I would like to ask you more broadly because we've talked a lot about loans. Can you talk more broadly, not just about for minority women, but the role of grants in general, whether you're a woman, a minority woman, a minority, a veteran, there's a lot of opportunity out there that we haven't touched on. So could you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I saw the question as well. And I thought that's a good question because it applies to many different groups. Um, and many will know this well. I'm a big believer that there's always some money out there. You know, I'm not so much of this believer that there's a limited amount of pie. Um, if you think there's something out there for you, go look for it. Trust me, there are people who are giving scholarships, giving grants, and you want to see what's out there, especially if you've not done it before. Um, then you may not realize that a lot of organizations offer grants, they offer scholarships, they offer different ways for supporting small businesses that are aligned with the interest of that particular organization. So get to know those organizations, especially community organizations, very big supporter of small mm -hmm. businesses. But um, for me, I, I just like to approach things from the attitude of if I want it, it's already out there. So go get it. Go get to typing, get to researching. I believe, you know, that there is something out there available. And the biggest part is pursuing it and 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 not giving up. You know, that's what we've been seeing lately, that resilience. Well, thank you. That is the perfect spot to end it. I want to say thank you to all of you, Lenore and Manny. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise today. And to the audience, thank you for all your great questions. Neil, as always, thank you very much for sharing your insights and expertise. And now, Neil, I am going to turn it over to you for your interview with the Honorable Jovita Carranza, who is the administrator of the Small Business Association, administration, sorry. Thank you all so much. And uh, Neil, you can take it from here. Well, thank you, Jeanette. Thanks for uh, leading that uh, very helpful discussion. Um, and as you mentioned, it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome to the stage the Honorable Jovita Carranza, the 26th Administrator of the Small Business Administration. Administrator uh, Carranza serves as a member of President Trump's cabinet and is the chief advocate for small businesses in our federal government. She has a long and storied career, both in public and private sector. She served as the treasurer of the United States. Uh, at some point, not now, but at some point, take out your wallet, look for signatures uh, on those dollar bills. You might just find Administrator Carranza's signature uh, right there. She also served as the deputy administrator of the SBA. And before government service, had a distinguished career at UPS, becoming the highest ranking Latina in the company's history. Administrator Carranza, welcome to the big week for small business. Administrator, welcome. Thank you, Neil. I think I heard a, a few applause. Was that the entrance? <laughs> well, that, that, that was the entrance. You know, all the all these digital things that they do these days. This is um, neat. I can tell by your background. It looks like you're in your office. Actually, I'm in the conference room. So uh, you'll see all the administrators, previous administrators behind me in those uh, pictures. Well, I know uh, for the you know, this is the past seven months have been busy for a lot of people. They've been especially busy for you. You've been hard at work at the SBA, but you've also been out in the country uh, talking to small business. I think you were just in Pennsylvania, for example. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're learning in your travels as you're meeting small businesses. Neo, that's a great question because one of the reasons I'm out there traveling, as you know, this pandemic really hurt many, many businesses, both small and large, and my my role and my purpose for being out there is to learn how they apply the Paycheck Protection Program 
uh, funds, as well as how are they managing during these pandemic times? And are they at the stage of recovery? And I have some pleasant uh, news for you, Neil. You'd be uh, very pleased to know that during those sessions, when I'm out there meeting with the small businesses and their lenders, I also have in the room members of the chambers, the local chambers, whether it's in the Hispanic chamber, the black, uh, uh, black um, chamber, or the members of the US chamber. And so it's an entire ecosystem that is addressing these small businesses to learn exactly how they're doing uh, and how they're faring during these uh, tumultuous times. So, uh, you know, we often um, we often focus on uh, the hardship that that so many small businesses are facing, and there are some true hardships, particularly uh, for those small businesses that are in industries that just rely on on people coming together and people congregating. Um, but it's also important to recognize that there's a lot of resilience going on out there. Um, you know, small business owners are small business owners because they're resilient and they're entrepreneurial and they're innovative. And I suspect you've had a front row seat uh, to see a lot of that resiliency and innovation. I think it's an important example for our audience to hear. So tell us a little bit about some of the things that you've seen that, that are, are, are impressing you. Well, Neil, with, uh, within all the members I just mentioned, whether it's the district director or the resource partners, members of the chamber, the lending community, we're there to address any particular issues the small businesses are expressing to us, uh, uh, whether there's concerns, whether there's compliments on how the PPP uh, served as a lifeline, as well as uh, learning how they're going to pivot and adjust and adapt uh, to their next uh, stage. And I'm very pleased to share with the audience that now, it's not only resilience, but their innovation is really um, encouraging and quite motivating how they've taken one business plan, adapted to the PPE, which is the personal protection uh, equipment needs of our country. And in many cases, they're running two production lines in the manufacturing. I visited anywhere from a distilling, uh, whiskey distilling, to um, uh, gift shops as well as restaurants. You know, as you know, the food industry really got hit hard, and so I visited um, oh several restaurants anywhere from Massachusetts to North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Illinois, uh, as well as Pennsylvania, as you mentioned earlier. And without a doubt, what what tapestry they actually create is one of cooperation, collaboration. They've extended and expanded their relationships with the lending community as well as the chambers. And now they know more about SBA than they ever knew before. And as you know, uh, Neil, in many cases, some of these businesses are not only experiencing the COVID disaster, but they're also realizing the civil unrest disaster as well as a natural, uh, natural uh, disasters like hurricanes and tornadoes and floods and whatnot. And so SBA is there to learn not only what more can we do, but as an administration, what more can we provide them in assistance so that we can enable half the GDP of the United States. When the president puts small business front and center and he tasks Treasury and SBA to collaborate, coordinate efforts in order to um, distribute and implement with the lenders the Paycheck Protection Program funding, that really elevated at all the small businesses in the United States, all 31 million of them. And as you know, they represent 60 million employees. And so every time I visit, and I, I not, not only speak with the CEO, but I also visit with their employees and engage with them and ask them, how are they managing? And are they pleased they're back to work? How long were they off of work? And inevitably, all of them will say, I'm just so pleased that my CEO, my owner um, applied for the PPP and we came back to work immediately or never left. And in many cases, some of the small businesses are actually looking to add employees. So it's very, very encouraging to learn. It's not what you read here uh, in the local newspapers. It's really going out in these states and visiting their sites and speaking with their employees and speaking with the CEOs, touring their sites and really um, observing how they're thriving in today's economy at, in the midst of this pandemic. Administrator, so many good good points there. Um, you know, I'm reminded our 
uh, our U.S. Chamber Met Life Survey, more than one in 10 small businesses have more employees today than they, they had in February. So um, there, are, there are divergences and differences and as perhaps as many different stories as there are uh, different small businesses in this country. Um, you also pointed out that uh, 20, even if there was no pandemic, 2020 would have been an exceptional year from you know, hurricanes along, along the southern coast to, to wildfires on the west coast and some of the, the civil unrest that we've seen in, in many urban centers. You add on top of that the pandemic, and I have to imagine that m more small businesses, maybe in history, today have a relationship with the SBA and have taken advantage of SBA programs to navigate one or, or even more of, of the challenges that 2020 have, have thrown at them. As you think ahead to 2021 and, and beyond, um, how is that going to change the relationship? What opportunities does, does, does that present for the future in terms of how the SBA can assist small businesses, not just to survive this current moment, uh, but, but to go forward? Well, I'm very pleased to share with you that SBA has processed, oh, close to a third of the small businesses' uh, loans at SBA. And, and that equates to a little over $700 billion between the Paycheck Protection Program, which is a little over $500 billion, and uh, close to $200 billion in the EIDL, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Portfolio. Combined with those funds and the number of applications that have been um, submitted by small businesses, anywhere from an independent contractor to a sole proprietor to a manufacturing business uh, that has uh, four or 500 employees, they represent about, let's see, 5.2 million in the Paycheck Protection Program funding and about uh, 3.8, we're working on 3.8 million small businesses applied in the idle. And that is more processing than SBA has ever experienced in the 67 history of SBA. So you can imagine the, not only the trajectory, but how we're going to transform SBA to be a lot more responsive, uh, amplify many of our programs, which we call the flagship programs like the 7A, the 504, the Community Advantage. We even created a loan, a new loan called the Community Advantage Recovery Loan uh, for micro lending. We have some investors that really want to provide liquidity to some of the CDFIs so that they can provide um, loans to the smallest of small businesses so that an independent contractor sole proprietor can borrow a thousand to five thousand dollars so the touch points that we've had uh, because of this pandemic and because of the numerous disasters that we're uh, experiencing the um, economic i'm going to say the business disruptions as well as the natural disasters that uh, warranted so many more businesses to learn about sba when i'm out on the field i ask them so how did you learn about SBA and how long have you been working with SBA? I would say about a third of them said, I never knew about SBA. As a matter of fact, I only know about them because the lender referred me to them. And I know about them because my banking partner actually introduced me to the, the local leadership. And so now there are different distribution channels and an extensive network of uh, businesses that are uh, associated with SBA now, not only from a lending perspective, prior, like the 504 loan or the 7A loan or the Community Ad Advantage loan. Now, because of the Paycheck Protection Program, we have, as I indicated, over 5 million small businesses that have become associated with SBA. So our programs are going to have to be much more relevant because a lot of small businesses are already well established but they're considered small businesses and they have different needs than a startup or one that's emerging or one that's ex uh, interested in uh, exporting. So we have um, a lot of work to, ahead of us, but again, the, this administration and the president and, and SBA uh, will work 24 seven until we recover the small business economy. That's our focus right now, to make sure that the small businesses are thriving 
as they once did before uh, COVID hit. As you know, uh, Neil, the Hispanic small businesses had a very strong trajectory before the COVID. And our small businesses were growing at such a pace that they were having difficulty identifying skilled workforce. And that's another um, challenge that we will have to work with and through with our small businesses and the ecosystem that I talked about, um, collaborating with the chambers, collaborating with the uni local universities. You know, the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities have been very instrumental on how we've expanded our women's business centers. We actually installed two women business centers in, in the first of its history uh, in uh, two um, historically black colleges and universities. So we're very excited about how SBA is now engaging much more deeply with the community and the public-private uh, partnerships. I want to come back in a moment to uh, the underserved communities, but I don't want to lose a thread that you picked up on um, that I think is really important as we think about economic recovery and going just not just to recovery, but growth, right? We, we don't want to just recover. We want to grow. We want to expand. Uh, we want an economy that's thriving. We want to have the problems again of, of trying to find workers in a highly competitive uh, environment. And we know historically that small businesses have overpunched, over contributed their weight in terms of new job creation. And there's no reason that this recovery and growth period is going to be any different than that. And you've mentioned some of the new tools that you have already launched the micro loan program, for example, which is gonna be really important in starting a lot of these small businesses. As you think to the future, um, are there tools that you're looking to add to your tool belt, uh, maybe like that micro loan program uh, to help small businesses going forward? Not only in the loan portfolio, but in the technical assistance, uh, the toolkit there, we're advancing a, on, the, on the website a training um, tool for designed specifically for women who are emerging into another market or to another um, ex to an exporting stage. Um, and let me give you an example of the women manufacturing owned businesses that I've met in Pennsylvania. I met of about five or seven of them, and they're all in a growth mode. And the language we spoke then was we're no longer or they're no longer thinking about just in time inventory it's about just not just in time like we've always had learned for efficiencies and overall cost containment but now it's just in case so these women are very much uh, poised to address if there's another surge in the uh, the uh, covid and what would that result in in their businesses because they were totally um, shocked and demised at, at the fact that their businesses came to a sudden closure. As you know, Neil, um, many of the states had variances of how long they closed and how they closed. And many of these businesses were at the, at the um, mercy of the governor's rulings. And right now, what we want to do is to provide guidance on not only how to prepare for the next pandemic, but also how do we help them with their suppliers? Because the supply chain um, network really has caused some problems on um, pro helping them uh, provide for their contracts. In other words, they don't have enough supplies or the, it takes a long time to acquire those supplies, not only internationally, but nationally. Um, so there's a, there's a dynamic business model that's evolving, uh, Neil, that is not so simple as saying, we're going to assist them with technical assistance in, as it relates to training tools on the website, or um, we're going to provide um, lender match tool on the website where they could be um, matched with a lender so that they could have access to capital. So our, um, our tools are going to have to be a lot more sophisticated I'll give an example. I visited a port and the port director was very much interested in mo the movement of, of shipments nationally, uh, taking advantage of the USMCA, as well as the, tra the, the trade agreement that was just um, uh, approved and installed and many of the businesses are already taking advantage of it. But 
regulations, uh, tax cuts, and the sustainability of those tax cuts, as well as the reduction of regulations for small businesses, we have to look at policy, not only tools, but how can we advocate on behalf of small businesses? You know, the president put small businesses front and center with our trade arrangements, as well as our taxes, as well as reducing our regulations, and we have to continue doing that for them. Well, there's so much there, right? We got to get policy right. That's something we fundamentally believe at the U.S. Chamber. Uh, but we also have to think ahead. I love this. And by the way, I'm going to steal it from just in time to just in case. What 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 a succinct way of beginning to rethink how business is going to be done and what we need to prepare for um, for the future. So, um, Administrator, you've been very gracious with your time. I, I, I hope you'll allow me to ask you one last question. Um, you got lots of small businesses from all over the country on the line tuned in right now. Um, do you have a particular message for them, something that you want them to take home or, or a piece of advice you'd like to leave them with? Yes, I want them to know that this administration, SBA, myself, are very committed to their recovery and their success and their growth. So whatever we can do at SBA, we will be um, we can, we'll continue developing the tools, as you indicated, Neil, not only the technical assistance, but have deeper uh, relationships with the lending community. As you know, we've expanded from 1,800 to almost 5,500 lenders, and it's going to require some due diligence to continue having those relationships for the benefit of the small businesses who struggle to access capital. And then we really have a, a um, laser focus on the underserved market so that no zip code, no small business is left behind. And we want them to know that this president and this whole administration, SBA, they have a friend, they have an ally, and we're here to help them out in, in any way. And we also um, are very, very uh, readily available for their input. Well, well let me just say uh, from the US Chamber, we've had no better ally uh, in the SBA than you. Um, you and your team have been so responsive to all the myriad of questions uh, and concerns. And, you know, I, I can honestly say that, um, that the small business community would not have been able to navigate uh, this pandemic, uh, but for your leadership and but for your commitment uh, to small businesses and helping them see this through in, in really uh, tumultuous and remarkable times. So Administrator, you are super busy. Thank you for taking a few minutes uh, to spend with us. We couldn't thank you enough, not only for joining us, but for all the work uh, that you and your team at the SBA are doing. Neil, one last comment. For those people who are anxiously awaiting the forgivable application and what that experience is going to be, SBA is going to work very hard to make that a seamless experience and we will be working closely with the lenders and the small businesses so that they don't have to worry about that entire process. That's a great note to leave on, more practical advice for millions of small businesses. Administrator, thank you for joining us. Thanks thank for you, Neil, for all that you do as well. I appreciate our partnership. Thank you. Thank you. A, uh, a huge thanks to Administrator Carranza and, of course, to Neil Bradley for helping to uh, moderate that discussion. A lot of useful information there. And, boy, she certainly ended on a note of hope. So hope all of you out there are feeling encouraged after hearing from some really fabulous speakers that we had so far today. You know, this event would not be possible. I've said it before. I'll say it again without our presenting sponsor. A uh, shout out to Chase for Business and our supporting sponsors as well, who really helped this all come together. CDW, Dell Technologies, FedEx, MetLife, Square, and Staples Connect. Now, let's test everyone's memory. Do you remember at the beginning of the session, do you remember the question that I asked you? Do you? We asked, what keeps your business strong? Is there a word, a couple of words that come to mind? Why don't we reveal the answers now? We can see what sort of a little word cloud we happen to have, this was our question uh, earlier today. And we've, come on, come on, how good is that? Right in the middle, the biggest one, which represents that the most people submitted the word integrity. Oh goodness, that's giving me all the good feels right now. Flexibility, 
certainly something that you need. Resilience right underneath integrity there. Customer service. Let me, guys, let me tell you guys, as a customer, not as a small business owner, customer service makes me a customer for life. I tell everyone when I've had a great customer service experience, love you guys for that. A service, honesty, loyalty, shared passion, relationships, trust, faith goes a long way right about now. Really good stuff. Way to go, guys. Love seeing that and integrity right at the middle. I mean, that'll just make, that'll make me weepy right now. Um, so way to go. Thank you for getting those answers in and engaging in what we've got. So this program that you've been a part of so far today is just the beginning of a week-long series. It's aimed at helping you get the tools that you need, the ideas that you need to recover and to rebuild stronger, better than ever. Hey, don't forget, check out your event agenda that you've got and join us because we've got some more sessions throughout the big week for small business. Still today, we're just getting going here. Uh, we've got a special event with Dell. It's focused on technology, which matters for virtually all of your businesses right about now. Some breakout sessions as well for you to join in to discuss issues specific to your business, because no two businesses are alike. Everybody's got a different set of challenges. And if your DoorDash bill is just a little bit too high, let's be honest, it is. Uh, how about a cooking demo with celebrity chef Marcus Samuelson? So go figure, you might be able to make a meal at home and it tastes great as well. So make sure that you get that. That's going to be great. Hey, meet me, me uh, right back here. Same time, my living room, my home goods globe that cost $8. We will be here tomorrow joining you on the main screen. It's going to be great. We're going to have some great discussions with the aforementioned Marcus Samuelson himself and with the founders of the skim. I heard it said earlier today, if you haven't checked out the skim, by the way, um, I heard it said as what made newsletters cool again. It's a really slick way to get up to date on the current events. So check that out. We'll be talking with the founders of that. So glad that you're with us this week. I'm Steve Patterson uh, from Twin Cities Live. Look forward to seeing you guys again, same time, same place tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day.